Um, now I'm back and I'm hoping that people can either hear or see me. Apologise for any problems. Oh, I've got a nice message there from Alexandra. Uh, can see and hear me. Um, well, many apologies for, uh, for that. Um, this is the kind of uh, event that would have appeared miraculous uh, some years ago. Um, and uh, I remember the kind of early days of the internet showing my parents and uh, kind of pressing on the keys to try and kind of bring up the home page and the whole computer, you could just hear it clanking through the gears. Feels a little bit like this. And that's not a criticism of the fabulous uh, technology, of course, which underpins this. So um, welcome back. Uh, I have uh, gone through a, an introduction to the uh, UK cooperative scene. Uh, th those slides uh, and this presentation uh, I'm sure will be available, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, I come on now to a vision of uh, the role of renewable energy and the potential for renewable energy, drawing on the work of the writer Jeremy Rifkin. And uh, Jeremy, who's written a lot about energy um, over many years, talks in his book and his work on the third industrial revolution of the joining up of a range of technologies that have the potential to uh, transform the economic and business landscape as we know it. Uh, and that's combining a series of distributed technologies. Uh, so micro renewables uh, coupled with um, hydrogen and new solutions around energy storage uh, together then with a smart uh, distribution grid uh, and uh, a kind of a new transport fleet uh, of fuel cell and electric, electric plug-in vehicles. Now that's an incredibly uh, exciting uh, transformation that he describes uh, in, in that. And not known for kind of um, understating it, he, he does call that the third industrial revolution. I think it's interesting to note that that agenda does not rely on a, uh, a conversion to science uh, by our political leaders and, and, and masters, that his claim is, is not that uh, uh, mitigating climate change uh, is going to lead to dramatic governmental action. Uh, his argument is uh, led from a technology an enterprise and an innovation sphere, uh, the argument that this uh, is here to come. So that's some, uh, if you like, some of the, the, the backdrop. And when we talk about some of the uh, small scale initiatives in, in many ways that I will be talking about in terms of renewable energy cooperatives, they take place against that backdrop, that backdrop of awareness uh, of climate change, uh, the urgency of mitigation, uh, issues around adaptation as, uh, as you know, as well, particularly on the uh, the, the demand side uh, of energy and uh, and heat, but but also this third industrial revolution. Now, in terms of the UK um, overall energy uh, generation, uh, there's some figures here which I go through which compare energy generation in 2010 and what is uh, predicted uh, for uh, 2020 uh, with uh, targets that uh, are kind of set uh, for renewable uh, energy. And of course, there's no guarantee that these targets uh, will be met, uh, but they reflect um, a significant uh, growth uh, of a variety of renewable energy uh, technologies. Uh, and I guess the question is, is you know, is that muscular growth or, or, or to some extent, given that this is still minority, uh, is it uh, manic minisculism? And, and that tension between um, the first baby steps uh, towards a, a renewable energy revolution and the wider potential is something that uh, is core to the, the, the business models, understanding which technologies are the right ones to invest in. Uh, and which technologies are, uh, are coming to viability earlier, which technologies are 
most uh, socially acceptable. Let me just go through the um, uh, overall picture in terms of uh, renewable energy uh, in the uh, in the UK. Um, we have both um, uh, onshore and uh, offshore uh, kind of wind uh, in the uh, in the UK. Um, we, over 430 uh, onshore uh, wind uh, projects. Uh, Scotland has been uh, a major investor in uh, wind power, both uh, onshore and uh, offshore. And the Scottish government is, you know, is is a has a particular commitment, a strong commitment uh, to uh, to wind. Uh, to increasing uh, renewables more widely, uh, and included within that, um, renewables in community or cooperative uh, ownership. Um, now, just going to the uh, uh, next slide again, more widely around renewable energy. Um, some hydroelectric, um, mainly in the, uh, the Scottish Highlands. Um, but we also have, uh, you know, biomass, and that's been quite a popular uh, kind of model at a sort of community ownership um, level. Sometimes kind of feeding into uh, local kind of, you know, woodlands uh, as as well. Uh, an increase in, uh, in in solar, and again the emergence of uh, solar solar PV uh, cooperatives. Um, marine, which in some ways uh, could be so exciting, if if any of you. Have Ever spent any time uh, on a British beach? Then the sheer energy uh, and um, cold as well that's involved is, is enough to excite anyone. But marine appears to be lower key, one that I'm sure will develop. And then, of course, you've got the much wider setting uh, of uh, energy management, energy efficiency, um, uh, ground source, uh, air source, heat pumps, solar water. Uh, heat, renewable heat uh, kind of more uh, more widely. So that's a little bit about renewable energy as as a whole uh, in uh, in in the UK. And now to move on to uh, cooperative energy, renewable cooperative energy. Um, and it's an area that's moving at quite a uh, a fast pace uh, at the moment. And when you move at fast pace, um, it's sometimes quite hard to work out exactly what progress looks like because you take um, one step forward, one step sideways, uh, and then a couple of steps diagonally, and you try to work out, well, are we moving ahead or not? And I think we've had all of those. It's not been a, a all forward advance. We have some issues with uh, the regulator at the moment around some of the legal models that are uh, being used. But by and large, it feels like there is a forward momentum. And there is also a national policy framework that has been developed that, to support uh, community energy, uh, as it uh, would be known. So small scale, cooperatively uh, owned uh, or, or owned in similar models where there is an accountability, a social enterprise accountability through to, uh, to communities. Stru so a national strategy for that um, and a strong commitment from the uh, Secretary of State for Energy here, the Liberal Democrat, uh, Ed, Ed Davey, who is exactly who you'd want in that kind of role. Uh, we, are, we are lucky. Overall, we have around um, 600 community energy renewables projects. But many of those are at a relatively early stage uh, of uh, development. Uh, the models sort of vary around half a uh, essentially kind of charity or, or voluntary models, particularly those that are at, you know, early stage pre-development, uh, but also with a rapid growth in the, you know, the business side of, of the cooperative uh, kind of model. In terms of capacity, uh, again, I put the figures um, up here. Uh, if you can see those, we have around 66 uh, megawatts of community energy uh, capacity installed with a further 200 megawatts uh, in development. Now, is that large or small? A bit like my question earlier as to whether 
we had manic minisculism or muscular growth and it's a little bit about uh, about both we do have a wider uh, renewable energy cooperative sector um, with enterprises that are you know uh, not just involved in energy generation but uh, you know a range of services uh, around kind of energy uh, Dulles for example is a, um, a very successful uh, worker cooperative that grew out of the Centre for Alternative Technology in Machantleth in Wales and, and now has operations in Wales and Scotland and in fact works uh, around the world, developed a, um, uh, a kind of renewable technologies with uh, UNICEF for um, public health uh, programmes uh, as, as well. One of the attractions of the cooperative model is the ability to bring in members uh, with capital and what that means is that it gives communities uh, a kind of real and meaningful ownership uh, of the, uh, the the assets that are uh, that are there and you know, I think we have some figures about the extent to which people who object to onshore wind because they find the turbines uh, ugly uh, or an intrusion, Ch the extent to which those people change their mind if actually they are a co-owner uh, of those turbines in a cooperative venture. Uh, beauty, we concluded, uh, is in the eye not just of the beholder but of the owner as well. Now Energy for All is a, um, a, uh, an example uh, of um, an enterprise that's emerged in this field. Um, and it's a good example of some of the strengths of the cooperative model, what the Italians, our Italian colleague, colleagues would call a strawberry patch model of development, where one cooperative uh, sets up, sometimes with input from others, and then it supports other cooperatives to get going. Um, and Baywind Energy Cooperative, with support from uh, Swedish uh, energy cooperatives, was the first uh, energy cooperative established in 1996 uh, and a pioneer of renewable energy in the UK. It then helped to set up uh, Energy for All, which is a, uh, a catalyst to support other uh, renewable energy uh, cooperatives, and they've supported uh, eight other renewable energy cooperatives, uh, primarily wind, but not just wind as well. Uh, the cooperative group uh, is uh, a, a far larger mutual business. It's the largest uh, consumer cooperative uh, in the, uh, the UK. Um, but again, is an example of uh, inter-cooperation. It's a business that has uh, invested uh, very heavily, both in renewable energy technologies, uh, but also links with smaller scale renewable uh, energy uh, cooperatives. So that's been uh, biomass on its farms uh, and turbines uh, when it was operating farms. Those have now been sold to uh, a charitable uh, trust. Uh, but it also is an extensive use of user of uh, renewable energy, both for its uh, headquarters, Europe's most environmentally sustainable uh, building, but also for its, uh, its retail uh, outlets as well. Cooperative Energy is a, uh, a new arrival in the UK and an extraordinarily welcome one over the last couple of years. And it is a, a, a retail supplier. So I've been focusing mainly on the generation end so far. Uh, well, the, the retail end in the UK is dominated by um, an, an something an oligopoly of big six uh, companies. Um, and by and large, I mean, the UK energy market was privatized earlier than, than many or any others uh, in the world. But by and large, if you look at in the different regions of the UK, <clears throat> we've kind of got the same incumbents that we had before. So whoever bought the state electricity boards uh, and then British gas, uh, and those two tend to dominate those regional markets. But at a national level, we have six um, big companies, uh, including state-owned companies from France and uh, from Germany, but also a kind of sorry, a sorry story of uh, consumer uh, distrust 
uh, of the large energy companies. Cooperative energy has come in, uh, so it is a consumer owned energy uh, retailer. Uh, it's picked up various, uh, a variety of awards, has over 200,000 uh, members now, and has that beautiful side of the cooperative model that it can say, okay, we're a business, we need to make a profit, but we're gonna do it in a transparent way and the profit is returned to you as customers. Rob Dunning, managing director there, very active, has invested in the supply chain through to smaller scale uh, renewable energy uh, cooperatives. More widely, I talked a little bit about links with um, woodland and, uh, and, and forestry, there's a lot of interest uh, there around housing as, uh, as, as, as well, and um, agricultural cooperatives too. So in Scotland, the um, Scottish Agricultural Organisation Society um, uh, has uh, looked at um, anaerobic digestion. And that's a kind of technology which benefits from a cooperative approach because you need to have the right kind of scale, you need to have the right kind of waste, a discipline around that, and then you need to have the right use uh, for the energy that might emerge uh, out of it. So anaerobic digestion is one that, that could work quite well uh, on farm. This slide now, and again, uh, if, you, if you can see it, is a, is a map. And if you can't, then you can find it online uh, on the Res Co-op, R-E-S Co-op uh, website. So Res Co-op is a, uh, a relatively new network uh, operating across uh, the European Union. It estimates that there are over 2,000 renewable energy cooperatives across the European Union. And of course, it's not been the UK that's been the leader in this field, uh, but first Denmark uh, and, then, uh, and then Germany. In Denmark, um, uh, essentially Denmark responded differently to the 1970s oil price rises. Uh, to France. France went for a centralised model uh, and nuclear. Uh, Denmark turned to its farmers who used a cooperative model essentially to establish you know, very strong renewable energy uh, sector led by the cooperative sector but not exclusively uh, cooperative uh, in, in Denmark. And I look a little bit uh, at, the, at the German story which has been in, in recent years an extraordinary shift from uh, the kind of previous dominant utilities uh, through to um, a, a kind of micropower uh, and, and, and widely cooperative set of uh, suppliers, supported by a, a, a kind of a, a, a proactive um, and at times generous uh, you know, feed-in tariff to support those, but in recognition of the benefits of renewable energy more, more widely compared to non-renewables and compared in Germany to, to nuclear as, as well, where there is an, an intent to, uh, to phase out uh, nuclear. So then looking, and, and I'm going to kind of draw this uh, together and then just give you some one or two very brief examples um, to bring this to life. Um, we've been having a look at what the potential is uh, for community uh, energy in the UK um, and there's been a couple of exercises, one led by the cooperative group, uh, one for the, uh, the, the UK government uh, led by someone called um, uh, Peter Kapener who is involved in, in a new network in England called Community Energy England uh, now, both of which show that there is significant potential to grow but again still within the broader context of climate change we wouldn't put all of our money on renewable cooperative energy. There's a whole heap of other things that we need to do. Now, I said earlier that we take one step forward, one step sideways, one step diagonal, and the energy market is a complex market to bring change to. It's not a free market. There is no link whatsoever between what ministers say in their speeches and what happens in the market. Having said that, it's a highly regulated uh, sector um, flows of funding make uh, business modelling quite dependent on the policy framework, uh, the tax regime, uh, for example, uh, and the, the regulatory regime as well. And we have had a policy framework that's been relatively changeable 
And that's a nightmare to deal with. And when you're setting up a business, you need continuity uh, rather than change. But having said that, we've seen significant moves uh, towards uh, a positive policy, towards renewable energy uh, cooperatives. And there's more that we would like to see there, for example, in terms of local supply for local grids. So very briefly now to introduce, uh, to take you to, uh, to Lewis, um, in Sussex, um, it's a uh, it's a beautiful market town, an active community, um, an active community concerned about climate change issues. It is a transition town. Uh, that the model and movement that that was started in the UK by Rob Hopkins, which looks at the need for uh, an, an energy descent from non-renewables um, as they dry up. <clears throat> And in Lewis, the transition town got together, led to the development of a solar PV co-op. And quite beautifully, the solar um, uh, tiles are on top of the local brewery, Harvey's. Uh, so I just think they've got this completely right. And, and right in terms of that wider public engagement, it is not enough if you're concerned about climate change to generate energy in a renewable way. We have to deal with some of the issues around consumer behavior, and demand management as well. And to be able to offer local beer, Harvey's beer, um, and then local renewable energy as well, uh, I think is um, it shows the power of imagination uh, in this. And I talked a little bit, excuse me, flicking through these, but again, the slides may be uh, available. Kumarian, again, in uh, Wales, an example of community organizing, starting in, in, in working out how they were going to celebrate the uh, the millennium, remember that, uh, year 2000, and leading on to uh, the setting up of a, uh, a cooperative for a 2.4 megawatt uh, kind of wind uh, project. Again, showing the, the ability and capacities of communities. And what I do here within these slides is talk a little bit about what their experience has been uh, and also some of the difficulties that they've had. Many of these projects are like walking a tightrope. Uh, and it's easy to forget when you get to the other side quite how difficult uh, it was. Um, this is a, um, uh, an Archimedes uh, screw uh, in the uh, Yorkshire Dales National Park. And again, it's an inspiring project, uh, but it has had uh, a lot of difficulties in terms of the, uh, the, kind of the, the regulators and getting different companies in the grid to operate. Uh, particularly in the context of a national uh, park. So then just concluding that one of the key factors that has powered this new generation of renewable energy cooperatives is a model of community shares, which is using an advantage of the cooperative model in terms of being able to bring in uh, member capital. Uh, and community shares are, are focused on equity capital. Renewable energy is often capital intensive, um, but you will need equity capital in order to be able to make these enterprises work. And the cooperative model of, of member shares, withdrawal shares in a, in a UK context uh, of uh, cooperative and community benefit societies is a beautiful model because members can put up money and then withdraw money uh, with relative uh, liquidity, subject to the rules that the cooperative uh, sets out. So we have seen significant growth in the community shares uh, market and uh, working with the, um, the UK government uh, with its support for this, uh, we've established an electronic platform uh, called MicroGenius, uh, which is uh, available for you to look at, which is a, essentially a crowdfunding uh, platform uh, for these kinds of community share issues. And we've had renewable energy co-ops but also, um, as it introduced in the video, uh, pubs and uh, peers and a range of other uh, initiatives uh, as, as well. So I hope that's given you a sense of uh, the renewable energy cooperative sector in the UK and because we're good Europeans, a little bit uh, about some of the success story more widely across Europe in Denmark and in Germany uh, as well. And I hand back over to uh, to you. Thank you.
Thank you, Ed, very much for your insights. Ed will now answer questions that are posted to him using your type dialog box. Okay, here's a question from Declan Kluch, Research Fellow School of Law. Hi, Ed. What can Australia do to build up support for cooperatives? My research has shown that legal expertise in cooperatives in Australia is wholly lacking. There are not as many at the grassroots level and generally a lack of support structures and associations to generate interest in the form. Well, thank you very much, Declan. I'm an ignorant POM, um, so I, I would find it very hard to talk about the Australian scene, except in quite generic terms. Uh, certainly, uh, colleagues that I know well who have uh, visited the cooperative and mutual sector in Australia, I'm thinking particularly of Dame Pauline Green, who's the president of the International Cooperative Alliance, has come away uh, enthused by the, the level of energy and ambition that is there growing now within the, the sector. So clearly, uh, the Business Council of Cooperatives and Mutuals is the right place to invest time and energy to be able to build that wider agenda at governmental level. Um, and I know that, is, that there is expertise in um, you know, the, 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 the state level, I may have that, the, word, the word wrong there uh, as, you know, as well, so it's not just at Australia-wide. But the, the framework that the International Cooperative Alliance puts out, I think, is a very helpful one, which talks about uh, countries needing to develop uh, a framework to support uh, and, and harness the potential of cooperatives, which looks at uh, um, identity, um, supporting the distinctive identity uh, of cooperatives and mutuals, uh, legal frameworks, uh, enabling sources of capital, and the community shares model um, here in the UK is is a is a real example uh, of that. It's a it's a very easy model to use. It's not uh, hamstrung and red taped uh, by expensive you know share promotions, regulations, uh, or, or or the like. Um, and then supporting uh, cooperatives in terms of models of business that can get that. Uh, participatory feel and those productivity gains and supporting cooperatives as exemplars uh, of, of sustainability. So um, the frameworks are out there. There are other countries that are doing this uh, extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily well. Uh, Singapore uh, is uh, is exciting. There's a longer established uh, cooperative sectors, you know, elsewhere in in Asia uh, to learn. Uh, to learn from, but good luck with that. Thank you, Ed. Another question from Mitchell Gorman. Why should communities choose the cooperative model over, say, a trust or incorporated association? Well, again, I'm not going to talk to the precise legal models because I don't know them in Australia. Um, I think my argument isn't that every business should be a cooperative, but it's that every business can benefit by being more cooperative. So if you're a, a trust, for example, for me that has associations of, of being a, a non-profit business and a non-profit organization. And it, it is a weakness of some of the, the trust models that we see here in the UK that they were set up with this flawed DNA of trying to run a business but make no profit. And what that means is that you have no reserves, you have no cushion. The first year you make a loss, you go under. Um, and that's why the cooperative business model, which does focus uh, on member benefit, uh, as well as wider community benefit, uh, is a fully fledged kind of business model, is able to bring in equity capital, has got some greater advantages uh, for this. But it will depend a little bit on, on what you're looking at um, across the energy sector. And in truth, what we're seeing is uh, some quite sophisticated um, kind of nested arrays of different organizational models emerge. But, you know, I, I alluded to that when talking about Kumaran and uh, Ovesco in Lewis. 
that actually you had a voluntary association that gave birth to a cooperative business, but that might also lead on to other work. Maybe there's an association of local businesses, you know, in terms of energy efficiency investment or the like. So I think it's wrong to overfocus on a on legal model alone. And whenever I advise people who, you know, communities or, or members that, that have a business idea uh, are thinking about forming a cooperative, I always say don't start with the legal model. Start with the business model and what your plans are for the business. And then you can work out the legal model to fit. It, it's as if lawyers get their grips on uh, people too early. Um, but actually, if you bake in the wrong model into your legal uh, framework, it can be hard uh, to un undo that. So I'm afraid I've given you a UK uh, uh, a tint on the question that you asked, but I hope that some of what um, I've said may be of, of relevance to you. Thank you, Ed. Okay, the next question is from Richard Inwood. That's great, thank you, Ed. What is your view on quality of solar? A great deal of solar products are Chinese with a concern over quality. So the question is, if a co-op was to develop a large scale solar farm, how important is longevity, safety and performance to the success of the business case? Thank you, Richard. Um, I mean, the quality of the technology is changing all the time. And with mass production as, as, as well, it's having a transformative effect on unit unit costs as well. I mean, renewable energy cooperatives, and it's the nature of the technology that you get a return over a, a you know a relatively uh, long time period. Um, and I think that the cooperative and mutual model, and there's some research to back this, does fit that long-term approach, that long-term view quite well. It's one of the reasons that you know cooperatives and mutuals are so successful in the insurance market is that they take a, a, a long-term view of things. So you have to take that same approach in terms of your choice of, of, of kit and technology as, uh, as well. And I think that framework uh, and being member-owned allows you to understand and look at some of those trade-offs that might be there in terms of the, 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 the quality of the technology that uh, that is on is on offer, uh, you know I have to say this is one area where there's nothing like experience. There's nothing like people who've done it being able to advise others. And what we have been working on here in the UK is a a model of business support that is not premised on trying to get some expert from an agency to come in, but on connecting up practitioners from one renewable energy cooperative to another. So working with the support of uh, charitable foundations here in the UK, as the Fairburn Charitable Trust included, uh, we've established a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, model for support amongst uh, renewable energy uh, cooperatives. Um, and it's, it's proving to be, so far, you know, really popular. What we do within that model is we do pay the practitioners for their time. Because the trouble with being a pioneer, particularly a cooperative pioneer, is that everybody wants a piece of you. And all of a sudden you're finding it hard to keep the business going because you're having to go to other communities and advise them. And in this program, what we are doing is we're recognizing the financial value of that professional expertise in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, model. And it's a very exciting experiment uh, for that, that, that model of how to spread cooperative development. Thank you, Ed. Um, the next question is from Alan Gregg. What government policy and financial incentives apply to encourage investment in renewable energy products in the UK? Feed-in tariffs and the like. And how important have they been in stimulating community-owned renewable energy markets? Uh, thank you, Alan. And it, you know this has been um, an important part of it. I mean, Baywind Energy started well before you know there was there was any real kinds of incentives that were that were out there. You could draw down um, wider incentive schemes for you know kind of business uh, investment and, and, and angel investing. Uh, 
Um, so we've had an, um, an, an enterprise investment uh, scheme um, that's been up, kind of dated more recently with a social enterprise investment scheme uh, as uh, as as well. But the feed-in tariff has been a really important um, policy innovation um, over the last few years, and it was one that had to be campaigned for and fought for. It drew on the uh, the German model, but it provided the kind of long-term guarantees that are needed for the business model to be able to uh, to work. Uh, initially, the feed-in tariffs levels were set um, actually relatively high, and there was a, a kind of um, a bringing down of the levels uh, now to a to a lower level. Uh, some of the solar um, industry, um, you know, are quite uh, critical um, of the way that that's worked out. For example, for the solar, but that policy framework has been an important part of making the overall business uh, model and the business plan work. Because with the best spirit in the world, best community in the world, best intentions in the world, you have to make this fly uh, as a business. And you need to make that up, add up from all sources. Where are you going to sell your energy? Who to? What income sources are and have been key to this? Thank you, Ed. Um, we have time for one more question. Uh, this is from the co-op, the heart of Barossa. Hi, Ed. We are a large retail consumer co-op in the Barossa Valley wine region in South Australia with circa 17,000 members and 35 Mnet assets. Have you seen any consumer cooperatives branch in the renewable energy cooperative sector that you could give examples of? What challenges have they found? Well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'd love to come visit you if I ever come to Australia. Sounds sounds um, sounds wonderful. A beautiful place, I'm sure. I'm sure too. Um, <clears throat> I gave ex some examples when I was giving the presentation. Um, and if I go back to um, uh, the presentation, they, is that still on screen? Yes. So let me just take you back to. Um, uh, uh, Ovesco, um, which is the example that um, that that I that I gave and, and started um, to, and this may not be the, the the perfect example because it it may be that you know you know an agricultural cooperative on farm example is is maybe slightly uh, slightly easier. Um, but this cooperative started with a, a relatively small group of people that were uh, committed to the idea and had business skills. Again, that's one of the beauties of the cooperative model is that you're bringing in members that have got a passion for what they're doing and they've got skills elsewhere. Uh, you may have a somebody who is a, an accountant for a local business um, or an, an engineer for another business. You're not having to buy their skills uh, in a professional sense because they're coming in as members and organizers uh, to make uh, this, this work. It was in the context of the UK um, where we've had significant uh, floods um, repeated in more recent years, which have kind of focused people's minds on some of the, the threats and the, the issues in terms of, uh, of climate uh, change. And they were able to draw on support from uh, a, a cooperative in the region, uh, the Wessex Reinvestment uh, Trust, to be able to get some of the kind of early stage uh, set up going for the uh, for the cooperative in terms of, uh, of rules and the like. Then some of the difficulties they 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 found. Um, Lewis itself is um, in in the Sussex Downs. Uh, and so there are quite strong kind of regulatory uh, difficulties in terms of uh, operating in a uh, in a national uh, park. They had expertise, but not expertise in everything. So the sort of the marketing side uh, was uh, was you know was difficult. Um, they had quite a difficult negotiation through with the uh, choice of technologies and the installers uh, to go there. 
And when it comes to the business planning, thinking about the business plan and looking to make it work at an early stage, particularly cash flow over the 25 uh, kind of years was, was difficult. They didn't get the kind of support from, they, you know, they thought government would be interested in this or local authorities would be interested in this. Uh, and to be frank, they weren't. There was a lot more talk uh, than actually action that, that was, uh, was there. But what's emerged has been something that actually has led on to a whole range of, uh, of other actions uh, in the area. Uh, Avesco has been kind of nominated for uh, awards as a renewable energy cooperative, and it's starting supporting other renewable energy uh, cooperatives uh, across the country as uh, as well. So it's a good example, perhaps, of a of a community uh, kind of oriented uh, cooperative. But there will be others, other members that come through. And as I say, in, in your context, it may be thinking about how does energy and renewable energy fit alongside uh, your business uh, in terms of energy and in terms of waste? And where can you make something stack up? If not you alone, then you kind of working uh, with others. And that would be extraordinarily exciting, I'm sure, to see. Thank you, Ed. Unfortunately, we do not have any more time for questions today. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Ed on behalf of the BCCM for his time and presentation and everyone who has joined the webinar today. This now concludes today's webinar. A recording of the webinar will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you.